With millions stuck at home during this pandemic and with little to do, it's no surprise that people are turning to any form of entertainment. Mobile games are proving widely popular, especially among young people. And one Turkish company has cashed in on the craze after the gaming startup Peak was bought by tech giant Zynga for $1.6 billion. So how deep does Turkey's mobile gaming industry go? Haider Abbasi has this report. The pandemic has been a disaster for business. From retail to oil, every industry has suffered. Well, almost. One of the few exceptions is gaming. With more time to kill because of self-isolation and lockdown orders, people are finding comfort in their consoles. Here in Turkey, online gaming is thriving, not only among players, but also for developers. The entrepreneurship um is becoming more and more popular in Turkey. We have seen uh, uh, we have seen uh, companies like Gram, uh, Peak, and Rolik recently. All three of those uh, have been sold to uh, Zynga uh, for like very good numbers. And uh, I can see like more and more investment is like uh, coming to Turkey, uh, especially after such success stories. And while the economy is feeling pressure from the pandemic. The gaming industry is raking in serious money. Five years ago, foreign exports of online games were worth $400 million. But the Game Developers Association of Turkey says the figure will climb to more than $1.5 billion this year, nearly quadrupling sales. In a sign that Turkish developers are competing with the best in the industry, several companies have been snapped up recently. In June, American mobile gaming giant Zynga bought the Turkish firm Peak for a massive $1.8 billion, its biggest acquisition to date. A few months later, Zynga added another Turkish developer, Rolik, to its stable for $168 million. So why is the country's gaming industry booming? Analysts say one of the reasons is the young population. Almost half of Turkey's 83 million people are under the age of 30, and more young Turks are choosing to work in digital-related industries. There's also support from the government. In the past 10 years, Ankara has handed out grants and tax breaks to startups worth $50 million. We, we will very likely to see uh, much more success stories uh, coming out of uh, uh, in Turkey. So. Uh, I'm very positive about uh, the future of the uh, Turkish gaming industry. And I can see that uh, it creates a very uh, high output uh, for the, uh, as an economic value uh, to the country. Other advantages are that Turkey has 500 independent game development studios and 30 million active gamers. A strong domestic market has helped Turkey's gaming industry expand globally. In the coming years, it's expected to grow even more and advance to the next level. Heyda Abasi, Straight Talk. And joining me now on set is Özgür Karayalçın. He is the Business Development Director at VL Media, a Turkish software company focusing on developing mobile apps and games. And Hendrik Lesser, who is the CEO of the Munich-based International Production House, Remote Control Productions, and the president of the European Games Developer Federation. So, gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Hendrik, let me begin with you. How significant was Zynga's purchase of Turkish game developer peak for $1.8 billion? I think especially for the Turkish games community, it was the most significant moment in its history. There has been, of course, uh, other examples of success, but this is by far uh, the biggest yet. And as far as I know, also uh, in regards to exit, so it's a, an economic impact on the region. And I hope it's like a lighthouse for the region that games is not just a pastime for kids, but can be serious business. And for Singa itself, you know, to spend 1.8 billion is not something you do out of fun. So they have, of course, proper reasoning behind it, and they believe in the future of peak games as part of the family of Zynga. So I think it's uh, very significant for Turkey, for the Turkish community, but also even for Europe, um, because you know 1.8 billion as an exit is very big and very inspiring, I suppose. So, Özgür, how will this sale affect Turkish 
mobile gaming sector. Are there more to follow suit? Well, uh, I guess yes. Turkey is now a shining star of, uh, of the world in the game industry. So I'm sure in 2020 and 2021, uh, it will continue. The exits will continue. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have few companies uh, which are very valuable. Mm. So um, in your opinion, Hendrik, where does the Turkish game industry stand when it's compared to other countries, let's say the United States, China or Poland? Um, you chose good examples. So, um, of course, the US is a traditional gaming market. Uh, it's very established, it's very mature. A lot of companies are actually in the US. Um, you uh, said uh, and mentioned China. China is obviously an emerging market since 10 years. It's quite impressive how fast they were picking up. Poland is an interesting one within Europe because they are around in the gaming industry for a long time. And especially with the likes of CD Projekt, a couple of other companies being listed at the stock market in Poland. Poland is a significant player in Europe. And where does Turkey come in? You know, 20 years ago, I would say Turkey in regards to the games industry wasn't really on the map. And then you have uh, projects like Mountain Blade coming from Turkey, which when they started was more kind of a, let's say, obscure phenomenon, which of course now is very established. But uh, the mobile games industry in Turkey has been brewing for a, a couple of years. And uh, with this Lighthouse event, mm -hmm. I think really showed what they can do. So the future is bright. And um, I believe that there is going to be many more investors investing into the market in Turkey, but also in Turkish companies trying to conquer the world, uh, so to say. Mm. So I think that's a great sign. So Turkish game industry has generated huge profits with, um, let's say, modest costs, small workplaces with few people. Uh, but when we look at the big players, we see investment costs uh, increase uh, a lot. So do you believe that the Turkish producers aim to focus on more or bigger productions to become more successful uh, in the global arena? Well, actually, uh, when we look at the market size, it's, uh, it's, I think it exceeds uh, 160 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. And more than half of it uh, belongs to mobile market. So, uh, and Turkey's uh, game industry, I think 90%, more than 90% produces mobile games. So when we check uh, personal computers games and console games, it's really challenging uh, to produce a game. Mm -hmm. It takes uh, more than one year, sometimes two or three years to produce a game. And plus you need to have more than 100 employees. Mm -hmm. So it, it means money. And uh, to start with the PC games, it's not so smart. So our companies uh, prefer mobile games mm -hmm. because it's easy to develop. Uh, let's check hyper casual games. Mm -hmm. Hyper casual games actually uh, they are they are very simple games. You play just one finger mm -hmm. and in a short period of time. For example, when you are going to school with a bus, you just play a hyper casual game. Yes. That's why billions of people play this. So Turkish comp Turkish companies prefer this market because uh, we can produce uh, one game in a one week. Yes. And we can test it. So uh, I understand Turkish companies uh, prefer mobile games, but Hendrik, what is the global trend in gaming sector? Do people prefer mobile games over computers or uh, consoles? I would say prefer over. What we can see is obviously that the market still on mobile is growing. So this is suggesting that. But in the end, people are using multiple platforms. And that's what we see, for example, in China, which has been very mobile online dominant for a, for like, as I said, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, they do exactly that. They start to make PC games and premium games and so on, because games is a business, but a, games are also cultural expression. So people want to also create other experiences, other stories and so on and in mobile games you have a certain limit on what you can do so the more mature the market is the more diverse it's going to be and that's also true for the audience yeah. um, they not just want to play on the bus but they also want to play at home on a big screen on their playstation yes um, on their pc <laughs> yes so, so uh, how has covid19 impacted the game industry and do you expect a significant uh, decline in demand once this pandemic is over? The pandemic definitely increased um, basically attention for established games a lot. So it's like if your friends already playing a game, you were joining them in the game. So um, the, the big ones grew 
up to 300%, so it's really significant. Um, and um, I don't think this will uh, stay on that level when the pandemic is over, you know, let's hope sooner uh, than later. But I don't think it's going back to the levels of the past because gaming was, of course, still growing the last years. And I don't see why it shouldn't grow in the future e uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. So I believe that uh, in the end, it might have a little dip, but uh, mid and long term perspective mm -hmm. is still on growth. Yeah, so Özgür, a common trend in Turkey's tech sector is newly set up companies seem to have, um, let's say, short term monetary goals. They just want to grow to a certain point and then they just self sell themselves to a bigger company, a foreign company. Uh, tell us, could something be done to encourage those countries uh, to resist in a way to this temptation? Are well, there, for example, any government incentives? Well, actually, I don't, I don't think that they are, they are waiting for a certain point. Because uh, when you check the exits, it changed from uh, 100 million dollars to 1.8 billion dollars. So mm -hmm. each startup has its uh, own growth story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, this is a natural progress for our uh, industry, for our ecosystem. Because it has just started in 2000s and after 2010, uh, our companies have been starting uh, to grow uh, mm. very fast. But for so, example, Rolex Games, founded just 21 yes. months ago on a humble budget, as we say, was sold to US giant for $168 million. Is it just its story? Can we just explain it like that? But uh, of course, uh, I, I know their uh, story. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they had some uh, goals and they reached. Uh, but uh, I think we need some more time for our ecosystem. Uh, uh, when it gets much more bigger, I'm sure that our companies then will start acquire foreign companies. Mm -hmm. But we need some time. Uh, so uh, the uh, co-founders are learning and we are learning uh, day by day. I think we will, uh, but it's, it's a natural progress mm. for our uh, story. So um, Hendrik, Europe is an aging uh, continent. How are these games playing out for the elderly people? Are they also uh, interested in these new age games? Yes, they are. Um, you know, and when the Wii came out, which is already I think eight nine years ago, uh, we came up with a term called silver gamer, and that describes the elderly playing games. Um, so what's obvious is that if you haven't played games before as an elderly person, it's very tough to understand, you know, the controls, the mechanics and so on. So there have to be games which are also made for that target audience. But for example, also my company is doing all kinds of non-entertainment uh, games, meaning we make games for people who have certain sicknesses to be reminded to take their medicine and so on. So it's important to understand that games are not just entertainment. Games are a culture technique which you can use for all kinds of different purposes. So yes, also the elderly play and in my opinion basically everybody's uh, going to play. And uh, today, especially if you go to the younger and the mid age groups, it's, it's more or less everybody. Gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much, Özgür, for being with me on set. Oh, and Hendrik, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it a lot.